Hello, welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We are in the chapel at St. Peter and St. Paul, and I am joined here by Joel and Mary Beth and Aaron Westermeyer, and we thank them for putting together our videos every week and making sure that uh, this uh, video is available to you. And we hope that uh, this is a blessing to you as, as we worship together. And we thank you for tuning in. We're glad that you're here, and we hope that you enjoy the service today. Uh, we'd like to invite you anytime to come and worship with us in person at St. Peter and St. Paul UCC. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and we're located at 3001 Queen City Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45238. We would love to see you. We'd love to worship with you. Now, as we worship together on this first Sunday after Christmas, we pray that God will bless us as we continue to celebrate the birth of Christ, our Savior. Please join me for our responsive call to worship. Praise God in the heavens. Praise God among us. Praise the Holy One. Praise God who vindicates us. Praise God who sustains us. Praise God from the depths. Praise God in all circumstances. Praise God who made us. Praise God who shapes us. Let us all praise the name of the Holy One. The glory of God reigns in heaven and on earth. Praise the Holy One. Our first hymn is hymn number 151, The First Noel. See 
Please join me for our invocation. Redeeming God, you have met us in valleys, on stormy seas, and on mountaintops. We welcome your presence now as we come to worship you. We gather in gratitude and assurance that you are our God, and we proclaim with gladness that we are your people. Some come in need of encouragement or comfort, and others need a healing touch. We hunger and thirst for righteousness as we praise and honor your name. Transform us into living vessels of your love and living witnesses of your continuing presence in the world. Amen. When we are confronted by the presence of God, we become aware not only of our limitations, but also of the many times we fall short of God's path of peace and righteousness. Let us join together in confessing our sins to God and receive the strength that comes from the assurance of God's grace. Let us pray our prayer of confession together. Sovereign God, you have been our help from age to age. Remind us to turn to you when confronted with difficult choices. Remind us that you strengthened us on the journey. Remind us that our actions and attitudes impact our neighbors and ourselves. Renew our minds and spirits as we strive to follow your way of love and peace in the world. Amen. Rejoice, you who once lived in darkness, on you a new light is shining, and the light of God's glory shall brighten your path. You are healed, loved, and forgiven. Be at peace, live in God's love, and bring hope and justice to all of God's people. Beloved, you are loved with an everlasting love by the Most High God. Know that each day is a new opportunity for faithful and flourishing life in the name and path of Jesus. Redemption is available, and God's grace is sufficient for transformation and new life. Amen. Amen. Now we come to our time of pastoral prayer. We'd like to invite you to bring all of your needs, concerns, and joys to God as we pray together. And if you would like to share a prayer request with our congregation, there is a link right below the video, and we invite you to use that link and submit the form that will come up and share any, any concern or joy that you have, and we will 
share that with our congregation on Sunday morning, during our Sunday morning worship, and in our weekly email update. In this season of uh, Christ's birth, we continue to pray for peace in our world and in our community and in each of our lives. Let us turn to God in a spirit of prayer. O oh God with us, we live in the tension between the world as it is and the world as you promise it will be. The needs of our world are great, the challenges are real, and your love and your power to transform and change things is also real. Help us to be people who love the world as we find it and who believe in the possibilities of new life through Jesus Christ. O oh God with us, you know your world, and we open our hearts and minds to you, sharing our concerns and listening to your concerns and your calls to act. With a baby laid in a manger, we pray for all mothers and babies and those who support them. With a father learning a new role, we pray for all at new beginnings and living with uncertainty. With Simeon and Anna, we pray for all who wait in hope or fear, for life or death. With seekers and worshipers, we pray for your spirit to work in hearts, minds, and faith communities. With those who speak up, we pray for your will to be done and your kingdom to come on earth. With those in poverty, we pray for transformations of systems and an end to exploitation. With all of creation, we pray for climate justice, for an awakening to our responsibilities. O oh God with us, send your spirit to transform and guide us, and so to change your world in your ways. And now in these moments of silence, eternal and gracious God, we pray that you would receive each of our prayers that we offer to you. We offer these prayers spoken and unspoken to you, O God, God with us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray when he said, Our, our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, beginning at verse 10. The prophet Isaiah writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nation shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem 
in the hand of your God. Our next scripture reading is our gospel reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of eighty-four. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, why do you need a jeweler on New Year's Eve to ring in the new year? And what was Dr. Frankenstein's New Year's resolution? To make new friends. <laughs> and one more, I promise not to make any bad jokes for the rest of the year. That was said by a dad on New Year's Eve. <laughs> well, what is vindication? We read the word vindication in Isaiah's prophecy. Vindication uh, is defined uh, in one resource as the action of clearing someone of blame or suspicion, such as, I intend to work to ensure my full vindication. And a, uh, another uh, definition is proof that someone or something is right, reasonable, or justified. And the sentence that provides an example of that is, the results were interpreted as vindication of the company's policy. The people of Israel were looking for vindication. They were looking for a time and a situation uh, in which it will become evident that God has been with them. God has blessed the faith of the remnant. And as the prophet Isaiah understands it, the vindication of the people of Israel will happen when their nation is renewed and restored. And Isaiah is calling the people of Israel to look for that time. And, and he assures them that time is being promised to them by God. They have lived in exile. They are now back home, but their nation is fractured. There are many challenges. Life in Israel does not look like it once did. But Isaiah sees a time when the nation will be healed. People will be brought together. And God's glory will be evident in the land. And Simeon and Anna saw that vindication when they celebrated 
the presence of the Christ child, the baby Jesus, in their midst. God's glory will be evident one day, Isaiah says. It doesn't look like this yet, but Isaiah foresees a time when it will. Richard Gribble shares this story that I'd like to share with you. He writes, it was just a small white envelope that stuck out among the branches of our Christmas tree. There was no name, no identification, and no inscription. It peeked out from the branches of our tree for the past 10 years or so. Its story, however, speaks of how God makes all things new. It all began with Mike, a man who hated Christmas. Oh, he did not hate the true meaning of Christmas, but he did very much dislike the commercial aspects of it, overspending, the frantic running around of, at the last minute to get uh, a present for this person or another, the idea of buying something in desperation simply because you could think of nothing else. Knowing Mike felt this way, I decided one year to bypass the usual gifts of a shirt, sweater, tie, or even the gift certificate. I wanted something special just for Mike, but the inspiration came in an unusual way. That year at school, Kevin, Mike's youngest son, was active on the wrestling team. Before Christmas, there was a non-league match against a team sponsored by an inner city church. And the youngsters on that team were dressed in sneakers so ragged that the shoestrings seemed to be the only thing holding them together. This presented a sharp contrast to Kevin's team in their spiffy blue and gold uniforms and spanking new wrestling shoes. As the match began, I was alarmed to see the other team was wrestling without headgear. Those white helmets designed to protect wrestlers' ears. It was a, 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 a luxury that the inner city team obviously could not afford. At the end of the match, Kevin's team had won an overwhelming victory, taking every weight class. The boys on the defeated team still possessed a certain uh, uh, false bravado, a kind of street pride that could not be stifled through defeat. Mike, who attended his son's match, shook his head sadly. I wish just one of them could have won, he said. They have lots of potential, but losing like this could take the heart right out of them. Mike loved children, all children. He spent much time with them, having coached Little League and, and lacrosse. And, that af and, and that's when, Mike, when the idea for Mike's present came to me. That afternoon, I went to a local sporting goods store and bought an assortment of wrestling headgear and shoes and sent them anonymously to the inner city church. On Christmas Eve, I placed an envelope on the tree with a note inside telling Mike what I had done and that this was his gift from me. His smile was the brightest thing about Christmas that year and in uh, succeeding years. For each Christmas, we followed the same tradition, one year sending a group of uh, uh, children with, with mental and physical challenges to a hockey game, another year sending a check to a pair of elderly brothers whose home had burned to the ground one week before Christmas. The envelope became the highlight of our Christmas. It was always the last thing opened on Christmas morning, and our children, ignoring the new toys, would stand with wide-eyed anticipation as their dad lifted the envelope in the tree to reveal its content. As the children grew, the toys gave way to more practical presents, but the envelope never lost its allure. And the story doesn't end there, Richard Gribble says. You see, Mike died last year a victim of cancer, and when Christmas rolled around, I was so wrapped up in grief that I barely had energy to put up the tree. But on Christmas Eve, I placed the envelope on the tree, and in the morning it was joined by three more. Each of our children, unbeknownst to the others, had placed an envelope on the tree for their dad. The tradition has grown, and today it extends to our grandchildren, who stand around the tree wide-eyed with anticipation, watching as their fathers take down the envelope. We have all learned that even in the midst of pain and suffering, God will renew us with whatever it is we need. And so he goes on to explain, Richard Gribble goes on to explain, that the Christmas envelope brought a, a fresh and new sense of life to uh, the holiday celebration of, of their families. 
No longer was the celebration just about individuals or personal Christmas lists or that kind of thing. The Christmas season became refocused and renewed and transformed. And he writes that our thoughts and actions became uh, more like Christ Jesus, the newborn King of the Jews, who brings a new beginning to our world. Jesus came to make all things new, he reminds us. And so we celebrate. We continue to celebrate on this first Sunday after Christmas, the birth of the Christ child who has indeed and continues to make all things new in our world. In uh, the, the lesson, the reading that we heard from uh, Isaiah, we read this uh, prophecy, this proclamation to the Jewish people, to the Israelite people after their return from exile in Babylon. And the, and the prophet uh, Isaiah tells them about a new day for their people. Uh, the transgressions of the past, the sins of the past are, are forgiven. They are forgotten, and God will not concentrate on that. Instead, God is going to concentrate on their salvation, and God will focus on their future and the promise of tomorrow. The nation will be adorned with flowers and jewels as if preparing for a wedding with the Lord himself. And Isaiah uh, speaks in, powerful, in a powerful way about how God will cause righteousness and peace to spring up as a garden refreshed by rain as, as, as it yields new growth. God has been faithful to God's people and God will continue to remain faithful to his people. And salvation will be like a, like a light, a burning light, uh, reminding people of the favor of the Lord that will come upon them. Isaiah goes on to, to uh, offer his people hope, to offer his people promise, and he reminds them that they have not been forgotten and that they will indeed be vindicated. They will indeed be uh, uh, vindicated so that their lives, the life of their nation, will, will experience the, the glory of God and their faithfulness will be, will be blessed and their, their hope and their trust in God will be blessed. The message proclaimed by Isaiah in our reading, our Old Testament reading, uh, is, is a powerful message that speaks to us today. God will continue to be faithful. The past, our pasts, will be forgiven and forgotten. Now it is time for Israel and for all of us to experience the newness of God's grace and mercy. It's time for the people of Israel and for all of us to rebuild our lives, both figuratively and literally. It is the opportunity, once again, for God to bless the community of God's people. History has proven that God's people, God's people will not fail and will not wither, but God will cause His nation, His people, and His world to flourish. And so, sisters and brothers, May we join Isaiah, may we join Simeon and Anna in proclaiming God's vindication and God's blessing on God's people and the fulfillment of God's promises to us. Today is one thing, we experience the challenges of today, but tomorrow will be different and God will make all things new. One of the keys to living faithfully as a disciple of Christ is to live with the tension between promise and reality. Indeed, we live in a very real world with very real needs and very real challenges. But we are also sustained and renewed and inspired by the very real promises of God. Let us put our faith and our trust in those promises today. Amen. I invite you to join me in affirming our faith by saying the, these words of an affirmation for the new year by Christine Godspace. God, God is the, is the eternal, eternal rock from years beginning to its end. God, God is faithful. In each day, God is present. In each action, God comes close. Through all eternity, God is trustworthy. Yesterday, today, and forever. Sustaining, enlivening, making all things new, 
God is the eternal rock. Our next hymn is hymn number 162, What Child Is This? Let us rejoice in the God of salvation through our giving. May we embody the generosity modeled by Jesus Christ, who came to serve, heal, and to restore.
Please join me for our prayer of dedication. Generous God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift that you have given to us and through us. Use our offerings this day for the benefit of creation, the redemption of humanity, and your glory. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 164, Good Christian Friends, Rejoice. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that the service has blessed you and inspired you, and we hope that this is the beginning of a great week for you, and we look forward to worshiping with you again very soon. Sisters and brothers, as we depart this place and this year, may we go forward vindicated, restored, and empowered in order to be the blessing needed in the world. Share the hope, peace, joy, and love of Christ in word and deed, to the glory of God. Go in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.